Hello, my name is Alejandro Datas. I am assistant professor in the Technical University of Madrid, and I will talk about silicon and ferrous silicon latent heat thermal batteries. I will start explaining the concept of power to heat to power storage or electric thermal energy storage. We start with a variable renewable energy source, such as solar wind, that produces an intermittent power. Then the purpose of all this system is to provide a more stable power supply at the output. For that, the system uses part of this power that is generated during periods where there is no demand, convert this power into heat, and this, then this heat can be stored during some period, and when needed, the heat can be converted back into electricity, and this output electric power is then combined with the power that is directly generated by these renewable energy sources and results in this stable output power. The heat to power conversion process is essential in the system because it determines the fraction of the input heat that is converted in output electricity, which is given by this conversion efficiency. And the fraction of the heat that is not converted into electricity can be released at the output as low grade and low temperature heat to satisfy some other heating demands, such as, for instance, domestic hot water or district heating. Alternatively, it's also possible to directly use the heat without using the heat to power converter and use this heat to satisfy these heating demands. These kinds of systems can be described by several parameters, and the most important ones are shown in this figure. For instance, we have the price of the energy input, which is typically lower than the price of the power that is directly consumed from these renewable energy sources. And this is because this power is consumed during periods where the energy demand is lower and therefore the price of this energy is also lower. There is also the cost per power capacity, which is related to all the conversion processes, for instance, the conversion of power into heat or the conversion of heat into power and also the cost per energy capacity, which is related with the total amount of energy that is stored in the system. An important remark here is that these two parameters of the system are completely decoupled, and one could design independently the energy and the power capacities of the system. And this results in a new variable that is the storage time or storage period that is proportional to this energy to power capacity ratio. Last parameter is the round trip conversion efficiency that is mostly determined by the conversion of heat into electricity because the conversion of electricity into heat is a very efficient process. All these parameters impact on the levelized cost of energy, which is the most important metric function of this system, is given in euro per kilowatt hour cycle, and this is the function that we will use to make comparisons with other storage technologies. In this figure, I show the levelized cost of energy storage as a function of two important parameters, which are the round-trip conversion efficiency and the cost of energy capacity. I'm doing that for three constant parameters that are the price of energy input at 2.5 cents of euro per kilowatt hour cycle, the cost per power capacity at 300 euro per kilowatt, and the storage period at 12 hours. What we can observe in the figure is that the lowest levelized cost of energy are obtained for very low cost of energy capacity and very high round trip conversion efficiency, as it could be expected. The problem is that current existing technologies are either high cost and high efficient, and this is, for instance, the case of lithium ion batteries, or if they are low cost, they are also low efficient, and this is the case of electric thermal energy storage systems. Well, this very basic observation indicates us which are the objectives of each of the, these technologies. For instance, for lithium-ion batteries, the objective is to reduce the cost. But for electric thermal energy storage, the objective is to increase the conversion efficiency. Well, so the next question is how to increase the conversion efficiency in electric thermal energy storage systems? Well, we have two options. And the first one is quite obvious because it consists on increasing the conversion efficiency of heat into power. But this option is limited because of 
thermodynamic reasons, the Carnot efficiency uh, typically limits the real engines to not operate at much higher efficiencies than 50%. But we have an alternative, and this consists on using the heat that is not converted into electricity for supplying other heating applications. And in this case, we can increase the conversion efficiency of the system over 80% and then reach this very low levelized cost of energy. This is an example of how to integrate an electric thermal energy storage system in a regeneration application where we use solar photovoltaic power to satisfy all the energetic needs of a dwelling, including electricity, heating, and cooling. So the electric thermal energy storage system, which is indicated here and comprises these two boxes of heat storage and power generation, can accumulate part of this solar power generation when there is no demand directly from the loads. And then, when needed, produce some electric power to satisfy this electricity demand, but also some heat that can be stored in a low temperature heat store such as, for instance, a hot water tank. Then this heat can be used for delivering the heating needs, but also for powering a thermal heat pump that provides the cooling services. Well, this specific application is described in greater detail in this publication, and the main conclusions are that you can get very high energy, electricity savings over 70% and also heat savings over 20%, with regional payback periods not much higher than 10 years. Now, I will describe the particular case of silicon and ferrosilicon latent heat thermal batteries, and I will try to explain why these materials are interesting for meeting the two main requirements of electric thermal energy storage, which are reaching very low cost per energy capacity and reaching high conversion efficiencies. And I will start with the low cost per energy capacity. In this figure, I show the latent heat as a function of the melting temperature for different materials. The latent heat is given in kilowatt hour per cubic meter, and it represents the amount of energy that a material needs in order to change from solid to liquid state. Therefore, when you apply energy for melting a material, this energy is stored in the form of latent heat of the liquid phase of this material. And therefore, high latent heat means high storage energy density. In this figure, we can see that some materials have much higher latent heat or energy density than others. This is the case, for instance, of boron, of silicon, and this alloy of iron, silicon, and boron, which has been recently published in this publication. All of these materials show latent heats or energy densities higher than 1,000 kilowatt hour per cubic meter, which is more than twice the energy density of electrochemical batteries. And this is really important because increasing the energy density enables using fewer materials and therefore enables lower cost per energy capacity. For instance, in the case of silicon that has a cost per kilogram of two euro, the high energy density translated in a very low cost per energy capacity of four euro per kilowatt hour. But in order to understand if this number is high or low compared with other technologies, here I saw the volumetric cost in euro per liter as a function of the volumetric energy density in kilowatt hour per liter for several materials. And you can see that the lowest cost per energy capacity, which is in the range of 10 and 1 euro per kilowatt hour, can be reached with two kinds of uh, materials. First, with the two tanks molten salt systems that are used in concentrated solar power, or with this combination of iron, silicon, and boron alloys. The main difference is that using iron, silicon, and boron, you can get much higher energy densities over one kilowatt hour per liter. And as I said, this is a remarkable advantage because it enables reducing the containment size. Just as a reference, I saw here the case of lithium-ion batteries, which have costs over 100 euro per kilowatt hour, which is two orders of magnitude higher than that of the iron-silicon-boron alloys. But there is another key advantage related to the use of these materials, 
and it is that they enable very high heat to power conversion efficiencies. And it is because these materials have very high melting temperatures above 1200 degrees Celsius. As you can see in this figure, the conversion efficiency increases with the temperature for, for most of the heat engines. But you can also see that there is a maximum operational temperature for many of these technologies of about 1000 degrees Celsius that is related to the use of solids or liquids to transfer the heat from the hot to the cold part of the engine. And there are practical limitations related to the use of these solids and liquids. You can also see in the figure that the only technology that is able to convert efficiently the heat at those ultra high temperatures is thermophotovoltaics. And this is because this technology relies on the use of photons as heat transfer fluids instead of liquids or solids. Here, I saw a typical thermophotovoltaic device where you have the heat source, in this case, the phase change material that is in direct contact with the thermal emitter. The thermal emitter becomes incandescent and radiates photons towards a closely spaced photovoltaic cell. Some of these photons are absorbed in the photovoltaic material and they generate electron hole pairs. The elect these electrons and holes are collected separately and they are extracted to produce electric power. But there are other photons that are not very energetic and therefore they pass through the cell without being absorbed. In this case, you can place a rear mirror that reflects back these photons to be reabsorbed in the emitter. And therefore, these photons do not contribute to the heat losses. And this is key in order to reach very high conversion efficiencies that typically could reach values in between 30 and 50%. Here, I saw a few examples of latent heat thermophotovoltaic batteries that could be used for direct solar energy storage or for electric thermal storage applications. Well, the details of these embodiments can be seen in these three publications, but the most important aspect is that all of them try to solve a very important issue of latent heat storage, which is that the solid phase is created in between the liquid phase and the thermophotovoltaic converter. So it means that the energy that is contained in the liquid phase has to flow through the solid phase that typically has lower thermal conductivity. So all these geometrical configurations intend, are intended to uh, minimize the temperature gradient across this solid phase. Well, I will not enter into the details of these geometries. I will just show a few pictures of the system that we are building in our laboratory which is this inverted truncate cone geometry. And here are a few pictures of the system that has been installed in our laboratory. The system has been constructed by Ironback process. You can see the crucible, the photovoltaic cell that is located facing the bottom part of the crucible. And here you can see also the system in operation where you can see the crucible at temperatures over 1000 degrees Celsius and the photovoltaic cell an important remark here is that the photovoltaic cell is kept at low temperatures, even though it is very closely spaced to the crucible. And here you can see also the current voltage characteristics of this cell as a function of the crucible temperature. And you can see also how the current and the power increases when the crucible temperature increases. These are preliminary results of an ongoing activity that has been conducted in the frame of a European project named Amadeus. This project ended in 2019 and counted with the participation of seven European partners. And besides of the technological development, another relevant outcome of the project was the organization of the first international workshop on ultra-high temperature thermal energy storage. This workshop was not only attended by the European partners of the Amadeus project, but also by other institutions from the academic and industrial environments. And we discuss about the many technological possibilities related to the field of ultra high temperature thermal energy storage. And a summary of all these discussions will be released in the form of the first book on ultra high temperature thermal energy storage transfer and conversion, and will be released in September this year. I will just conclude saying that this technology enables 
very high energy density and low cost per kilowatt hour. It also enables very high conversion efficiencies because of the high temperature operation. And it is very appealing for applications such as cogeneration and regeneration because of the higher overall conversion efficiencies. And I haven't talked about this, but it also enables very long discharge time applications. And this is because of the low cost per kilowatt hour that enables building systems with large energy storage capacities. But there are many challenges, of course. One is the development of low cost containers that are compatible with these exchange materials at very high temperatures. Thermal insulation is also very challenging at these high temperatures, and especially if we want to use very long discharge periods. And of course, reliability is an issue related to the compatibility of materials at those very high temperatures. So thank you very much for watching, and here I leave you my contact details in case you have any comments or questions. Thank you very much.